politician's time is precious and there are more things to do in a day than you have hours to do them. But I hope you'll take some time to think about ethics today. I've known some politicians who have not had the time for ethics and have ended up doing time. Most politicians don't suffer quite that fate, but unethical behaviour may lead to premature retirement when politicians who act in haste can find that they need to repent at leisure and think about not just what went wrong, but what they did wrong. So I hope you'll spend some time today looking at these uh, videos and most importantly reflecting on them. The politicians and architects have followed in a number of traditions. Gothic Revival, reflecting its English origins and British reconstruction. Greco-Roman, and even some examples of French Empire style following the Crimean War. Some sought to better represent their own architectural traditions. Some bold architects struck off in new directions. For example, the Australian Parliament was cut into a hill with the top a large grass space so that citizens could walk on top of their elected representatives. Unfortunately, concerns were raised that citizens might bear them more than mere contempt and might come armed with more than verbal barbs. At this point, the green and pleasant mound started to look a bit like the grassy knoll and its life as a public space was short. The buildings are impressive and the rooms can be spectacular. Indeed, they are often remarkably tasteful given the egos of those who commissioned them. We will be filming in two of them. Given the English weather, we will, like parliamentarians, do our talking inside. What do you do with the power that's been entrusted to you by those who have elected you? This may seem to be a purely political question, but it's very much an ethical question too. It's a version of Peter Singer's fundamental ethical question, how should we live our lives? Answering that question involves asking hard questions about your values, you're giving honest and public answers, and living by those answers. If you do, you have integrity. If you don't, the first person you cheat is yourself because you are not the person you're claiming to yourself and the world to be. As it is for individuals, so it is for institutions. Institutions to be ethical also need to ask fundamental questions about their value and their values, give honest and public answers and live by them. Obviously for an institution to go through this process it's more complex than for an individual. It requires leadership to help frame those questions leadership to uh, discuss those questions honestly and come up with answers that are shared by that institution and then of course to devise ways to ensure as far as possible that the institution lives up to the answers that it's given and can be seen to have institutional integrity. This process starts with the vital questions that must be asked of any institution or organisation. What is it for? Why should it exist? What justifies the organisation to those who have entrusted it with enormous powers and extensive privileges? What justifies the risk that the community takes in placing such powers in the hands of those who might abuse them? This is not an idle or an offensive question. Legislatures and governments they choose have abused their powers and privileges in the past, in other jurisdictions, and are always suspected and frequently accused of such abuse to this day. Politicians are used to justifying themselves and their parties by claiming to benefit the community. This lies at the heart of political activity. However, the need to differentiate their parties means that they devote much less time justifying the institution in which and for which they compete. 
and they spend far less time in building structures and processes that make it likely that they will live up to the values they claim to further. However, if parliaments as a whole cannot justify their existence and structure themselves to live up to the justifications they offer, the institution in which and for which parties compete may lose its legitimacy and be rendered less of a prize to be won. Three points might be emphasised here. First, ethics and integrity are not just a matter for individuals, but for institutions, like parliaments. Second, ethicists do not seek to provide answers, but assist others to look for and frame their own answers. Third, integrity is not just a matter of stating values, but living up to them. By creating structures and processes that make it likely that the parliament will live by its values. How can that be done? There is no one correct set of structures and processes, and it is important that there be several mutually supportive uh, integrity measures, what we call an institutional integrity system. The overall result should make it clear what the right thing to do is, make it easy to do the right thing, make it hard to do the wrong thing, and make it highly likely that those doing so will be discovered. Common features of such integrity systems include a code of ethics, an ethics and privilege committee to draw up the codes and to consider complaints against members for breaches. All codes need to be supplemented by ethical advice outside the chain of command. In Queensland, this is provided by what we call an integrity commissioner who can give MPs authoritative advice on how to act ethically in specific situations. If they seek the advice of the Integrity Commissioner and follow that advice, they are protected from future adverse findings. There is also a really important element in that the, uh, such an Integrity Commissioner must be uh, non-partisan and appointed in a bipartisan process. There also needs to be an independent authority to investigate allegations of wrongdoing and advise the Ethics and Privileges Committee of their findings. Such independent findings make it difficult for the committee to act in a purely partisan way. In the first video, we talked about broad principles of parliamentary ethics. But it's very important to go beyond statements of principle to examine and address some specific issues faced by MPs. This process can inform codes of ethics provide examples and specific guidance in particular problem areas. The core idea of democracy is the people confer executive and or legislative power on politicians whom the electors believe will best use that power to serve electors' interests. Politicians play a vital role in that process, first in formulating alternatives as to how public power should be exercised for the good of the community they serve, then in presenting those choices to the electorate in open competition, and then delivering on the promises and policies they have put to the people once they have elected them. However, in doing so, politicians fa face a variety of dilemmas, temptations, tensions, and pressure points. These are areas of ethical uncertainty where contemporary political practitioners are genuinely unsure of what they should do. I'll address some of these issues in other videos, including the ethics of information, government advertising, political funding and lobbying. But first I would like to comment on two particular sources of tension. The first source of tension is to be found in the interactions between democratic and market institutions. In the modern liberal democracies in which most of us live, the majority of citizens value both democracy and the market. And there is popular commitment to the belief that politics should be dominated by democratic principles and the economy should be dominated by market principles. While both democracy and the market are built on a single broad principle of individual choice, markets and democracies involve two fundamentally different counting principles for evaluating choices. The well-known and often repeated counting principle of democracy is, of course, one vote, 
one value. The corresponding counting principle of the market is one dollar, one value. The eternal temptation is for those who have accumulated dollars in the market to use those dollars to influence decisions that are supposed to be given by the democratic principle of one vote, one value. Market participants may do this in a number of ways, by funding political parties and campaigns to outright bribery. The reverse concern is that those who have gained power by accumulating votes may seek to convert that power into dollars for themselves or their parties. Accordingly, defining and policing the boundaries between the market and the democracy is a perennial problem in modern liberal societies committed to both democratic and market principles. It gives rise to some of the most difficult and controversial issues in liberal democracies. Recognising these pressure points has at least two important consequences. First, unless we want to abandon either the market or democracy, these pressure points will remain and the integrity systems we design must watch out for the, that interaction and deal with it. Secondly, it is generally going to be much better to try to structure the interaction between markets and democracies in ways that reduce the pressure which give less work for the integrity system to bear. A second source of tension lies at the heart of the profession of politics. Professions offer alternatives to the electorate as to how power should be exercised and then to exercise that power in the way they have promised. This means that politicians are of necessity seeking power and it will attract those who want power. There is a good reason for seeking power, to exercise it for the public benefit and according to the values articulated to the electorate at election time. There is an unacceptable reason that will tempt some, that power can be exercised for the public good but in ways that the public would not understand and must not be told. And there is a totally unjustified reason that the power can be used for the benefit of the politician at the expense of those who elect him or her. It is in the interest of governments to use that power in ways that will earn approval and convince a majority that it is the better democratic choice. However, there's always a temptation to use governmental power to secure re-election by avoiding or distorting voters' choices. The crudest form of such distortion involves a cancellation or postponement of elections. However, there are many other means of avoiding and distorting that choice. Distorting electoral boundaries, manipulating electoral practices and electoral machinery, using government power to silence oppositions or governmental funding to promote government policies. As indicated in the first video, ethics involves asking hard questions about your values, giving honest and public answers and living by them. This is very much a matter of giving your answers, in this case Parliament's answers, and structuring yourself to uh, live by them, rather than living by an externally set uh, values, uh, certainly by philosophers and ethicists like me. First, with respect to individual integrity, does this mean that uh, you can hold any values? Does it mean that the proverbial Nazi could have integrity because he lives up to the odious uh, values that he, uh, that he prescribes? And the answer is yes, they do have integrity in this sense. But of course the requirement of giving honest and public answers means that the uh, this kind of integrity uh, is not likely to earn you a, parliament, a seat in Parliament but uh, uh, a jail cell because if you're going to be, have integrity and actually do, say what you'll do and do what you say, then uh, those, who, those who hold to the values set by our laws will actually find it easier to prosecute. Secondly, given that politicians are in the business of disagreement, how can they ever uh, agree on institutional values? Part of the answer is that they are invested in the process and have a common interest in that process working. Secondly, there's the 
same requirement of publicity, which will mean that some values uh, cannot be uh, 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 politically um, uh, argued for by politicians. Thirdly, I think we find that, uh, that debate, dialogue and discussion tend to produce either convergence or an understanding and uh, perception of difference. And that those who have very radical uh, or extreme views will tend to find a political career non-optional. And finally, when it comes to long-standing institutions, uh, the long the debate over centuries uh, means that there is a common understanding of core values of that institution which are shared not just by the politicians but by the public and therefore have to be shared by the politicians. Third and most importantly, this convergence will never produce complete and lasting uh, unanimity. In, institutions will always uh, attract those who think that the institution can serve the community better and in different ways. And there will be debate between those who believe the institution can and should continue to serve in the community in the ways that it has and others who want to develop new ways uh, for the institutions to serve their communities. This is part of the dynamic of institutional change. Institutions will always attract those who can see new ways of serving of the institution can serve the community in which it operates. And indeed, if institutions never change, if they are always true to the values and ends of their, uh, of their founding uh, generally fathers, then they will stagnate and they will lose, uh, lose their legitimacy and um, uh, wither away. The Parliament is the fourth oldest British institution. It's surpassed in age only by the monarchy, by Oxford and by Cambridge. These uh, institutions predated the joint stock company and the sovereign state by some 400 years. And they may well outlive both of them. But they've not survived and thrived by staying the same. They have done so by reinventing themselves and by changing direction. The monarchy started as a group of French-speaking invaders, including the barons who sought to take over uh, the country and rule on behalf of nominally of their king, but very much for themselves. Oxford started as a loose grouping of semi-monastic places of teaching. The High Court of Parliament was imposed on the king by Simon de Montfort and other barons, not to make new law, but to limit the king's power to make new law by declaring what the law already was. It was in designed to preserve baronial power and their capacity to oppress their serfs and prevent the king, uh, if he was ever inclined to do so, uh, from protecting them. The House of Lords started as an aristocratic restriction on the democratic tendencies of the commons. But all of these have changed radically. The monarchy has lost virtually all its power, but gained legitimacy and holds symbolic power in the place of politicians. The universities have changed even more radically uh, as they've embraced education and research and uh, supporting and uh, disseminating the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. Parliament has changed from a bastion of aristocratic privilege to being the cornerstone of British democracy and a model for democracies in a non-presidential mode all around the world. Of course, there will generally be a good deal of continuity 
and indeed often a recognition of the values at a deeper level. The monarchy became a matter of legitimacy. The universities for the broad ideals of education and the parliament from being a mixture of different interests to become the cornerstone of democracy. Finding ways to keep open the debate while still retaining sufficient uh, unanimity for an institution to perform its functions is not easy. But that is what good governance and good leadership is about. If the role of the politician is to develop, package and implement alternative policies to government so that the electors can choose, then it is easy to see why misleading electors and their representatives is so universally condemned. If there are real alternatives in policy, principle and values, then there should be real differences of opinion about which is preferable and it is the role of the politician to persuade the electorate that their ideas are superior. In their enthusiasm to persuade the public that their policies, principles, values are superior, they may slip into misleading or even lying. Indeed, a perennial complaint about politicians is that they habitually do so. Some may insist that they never lie, but they may seem to regularly mislead. The distinction is important, but in no way exculpatory. Lying involves making a false statement in order to adduce a false belief. Misleading involves making a true statement with the same goal of inducing a false belief. If electors find out that they've been misled rather than lied to, they're unlikely to be satisfied with the excuse, oh, I didn't lie to you, I merely misled you. The effect is the same, the intentional creation of a false belief in the minds of the electors. Indeed, misleading may of necessity be premeditated and by being more calculated, it is in some ways more heinous than a lie told on the spur of a moment when grasping for a response to an unanticipated question. Either action, misleading or lying, strikes at the heart of political ethics. The difference, of course, is whether you really believe what you are saying. If you really believe, if you really believe that your policies and general philosophy underlying it are correct, you should not have to either lie or mislead. The art is to convey to the public the reasons why you really believe it, the policy put forward is a good one for them, not to mislead them into choosing policies that are not. To be seen to win by other means discredits those values and policies and dishonours you, your party and those you claim to serve. Truth is truth, lies are lies, do not pretend otherwise. Governments collect information, develop policy, seek expert opinions and secure professional advice. All of this is at the expense of the people they represent. It is in a very real sense the property of the people. The question is to what extent should that information be made available just to the minister or the cabinet or more broadly to government MPs opposition MPs and, of course, the people who ultimately paid for it. There have been very significant recent developments in freedom of information and what's now called the right to know in most Commonwealth jurisdictions. However, I would add a strong property argument to the usual human rights arguments. Information produced by the government for the purposes of making and recording decisions is the property of the people. One needs a very good argument to deny access by the people to their own property. There are some good arguments based on security and so forth, but it is important that they are applicable in the case in hand. Because one must remember there are some very bad arguments for withholding information 
to prevent the public discovering that a minister or a senior public servant was wrong, foolish or unethical. And the worst argument of all for against freedom of information is where information is withheld because it would prove that a minister misled parliament or people. To use a power to withhold information for such purposes seems to be a very clear abuse of power for personal or party political ends and falls clearly within Transparency International's definition of corruption. Whether or not it is formally and legally included within anti-corruption legislation, our procedures should ensure that information will not be withheld on that basis or for that reason. In the case of a properly functioning national integrity system, ministers should, if in doubt, seek advice from the integrity commissioner or the information commissioner, and the latter information commissioner should always have the right to release such information. I would strongly suggest that all Commonwealth nations move towards a system of publishing as a rule and withholding as an exception. There is no doubt that the current system does take time and resources for both the seeker and the provider of information. With the digital and web revolutions, this need not be a major problem for the majority of documents and the majority of organised stakeholders. Most final documents can be put on the parts of public websites that are accessible to citizens and civil servants alike. This should be done as a matter of routine record keeping. It is just that this part of the file is open to everyone. There will be some documents still that are not uploaded and these would be uh, withheld uh, on the basis of existing rules and rulings established by precedent and regulation. But this approach to web publication of most final documents would not only respect the public's right to know, but increase knowledge of what the government is doing with two important effects. Firstly, the public would have a better understanding of what government is trying to do and either accept what it's trying to do or to focus their views as to how it might change what it is doing. And if elected or appointed officials are doing the wrong thing, public access to such information makes it much more likely that such wrongdoing will be identified. Furthermore, watchdogs outside the media will be able to be more effective and crucially, the citizenry will not be as limited to the existing media as the source of knowledge about the activities of their elected officials. Politicians can be exposed to a good deal of generosity to themselves and to their parties. Sometimes that generosity is spontaneous, sometimes it's calculated, Sometimes it's sought and sometimes it's corrupt. The cost of election campaigns puts great pressure on the ethics of politicians and political parties. Reciprocity is critical to effective social interaction, but it can have a corrupting influence on political interaction. There are good reasons that ethics guidelines for receiving gifts be the same for all. On the basis of simplicity, ease of reference for prospective recipients and givers, and transparencies. Furthermore, the public will not get unnecessarily concerned with gifts within the standard permissible limit, but will be in a better position to be able to report suspicions that someone has received a little bit too much. Any deviation from a single rule would need to be justified, and indeed there is much to be said for uniformity in the same jurisdiction. Political donations and fundraising is one of those areas where the best approach is to reduce the pressures generated by the need to seek funds, rather than to rely on integrity measures to prevent abuses. While one should always look to improving the latter, it is best if they are not required to do too much work and to hold back a, a, a tide generated by political competition which is at the heart of democracy. Most of the ideas for doing so have been around for a very long time. For example, providing time for political parties at election as a condition of broadcasting licence and other political advertising should either be banned or funded by the government. Attempts at restricting political donations are likely to attract the same avoidance techniques that greet any new taxation measure. 
The solution is to ensure that the means by which funds can be provided to political parties should be defined by inclusion rather than exception. There should be specific ways of supporting a political party and all others are void, leading to for forfeiture of money provided other than in an approved way. A solution that reduces the reliance on outside funding for election campaign avoids putting temptations in the way of politicians while carrying out their critical role in presenting, packaging and implementing their policies. This can be done solely on the basis of what will appeal to electors without the distraction of considering what donors will think and what will appeal to them. It would also free up time for front benches. As we said elsewhere, a minister's time is one of the scarcest resources in government. Access to it must never be bought. Ministers should decide whom they want to consult and whom they should see in exercising their public office. This may well be much the same group of people whom the minister would have seen anyway at fundraisers. However, the decision is for the minister and staff, not for the party and those from whom the party seeks to raise money. Parliamentary debate can be vigorous and even entertaining, but it rarely persuades the other side. But that is not the point. The point of political debate is not to persuade the other side, but to persuade the electors. This is done in media interviews and in some jurisdictions by political advertising. Government advertising need not be false or misleading to be problematic. It has a legitimate function in providing information on government policies to those who may be affected by them. However, it's capable of abuse if the main effect is to just paint the government in a better light. Given that this is public money that is not available to the opposition, this could constitute a particularly unfair advantage and provides a great temptation to any government. It may enable a government party to entrench itself in power using the fruits of past electoral victory that is control over government resources, to perpetuate future electoral victories it would not have won had the playing field been level. I've suggested to various parliamentary acquiries in Australia that Parliament should treat the potential abuse of political advertising in the same way as corporations identify and deal with risk. Corporate boards must list risks on the basis of their magnitude and their probability. Once a board has established a risk, its magnitude and the likelihood, then it is bound to consider what it can do to limit the likelihood of the most probable and serious risks materialising and preventing the damage that would be done if they did materialise. In the case of political advertising, there's actually universal agreement that the, there is a problem, that the magnitude is great and that the risk has actually um, uh, emerged in many cases. We see the government will accuse the opposition, when in power, of having abused government advertising. The opposition will accuse the government of having abused its powers. And the, back, and the crossbenchers will say that both of them have abused their power. So therefore, everyone agrees there's a risk, everybody agrees that it's significant, and everybody agrees that not only is a risk that might materialise, but it's a risk that materialises on a regular basis. While I am not going to say that governments and parliaments should always act like corporate boards, it is always worth considering how they would approach similar problems. I've also noticed that there's a very important side effect of having an independent, highly credible body certifying the accuracy and non-partisan nature of government advertising. This will give the advertising campaign greater credibility and increasing the likelihood that it will be accepted. It will also make it far less likely that the campaigns will be attacked as false and if it is so attacked, the government can brandish the independent arbiter's decision. This oversight will save time and money and increase the efficiency and effectiveness of government advertising with electors money. There are many demands on MPs' time and even more on ministers. Unfortunately, their time, like ours, is strictly limited to 24 hours in the day. To whom should you give priority during that time? Your constituents to understand their concerns, your colleagues to discuss legislation, or lobbyists conveying the views of those who pay them? 
There are many justifications for lobbyists, including assisting interested parties and groups understand government decision making and ensuring that they are consulted. However, the better government explains the decision making process and the better it organises its own consultations, the less there is need for lobbyists. And the more that the information that lobbyists sell to the few is provided to all. In this, if this process were perfected, demand for lobbyists might evaporate. Of course, no process in any institution is perfect and demand for lobbyists is likely to remain. Governments could abolish lobbyists, but then lobbyists would be brought in-house into the organisations that currently employ this. So for this reason alone, it is better to regulate than prohibit lobbying. One important integrity measure would be to require that all meetings involving those who might have an interest in the minister or department's decision should either be minuted by a public servant and or recorded. Such records could be confidential but would be available to integrity agencies if a later investigation is required. This measure actually constitutes a protection for the minister and the party concerned, in addition to the benefits for political integrity. This provision does not include social occasions, but guidelines must be that business is not discussed at social occasions and ethics codes may need to address the issues of when uh, social contact is made outside of a business uh, relationship. This is similar to rules for lawyers and judges in uh, their own interactions when matters are before a judge uh, on which the represented, legal representative is, uh, is appearing. The United States has long had restrictions on employment for ex-government officials in areas relative to their former official role. This approach recognised one of the most obvious pressure points between democracy and the market, and a temptation when making decisions about potential employers while in office and the use of information and contacts after office. There is one issue that should be acknowledged. MPs lose office because of the performance of their party and not necessarily themselves. Those who stay for two or three terms are significantly affected. Their careers have been disrupted and they will find it difficult to go back to where they were, let alone where they would have reached. Their political experience will not necessarily have prepared them for other work. However, their political experience will have increased their capacity for advocacy and lobbying. These special features identify some of the reasons why it is rational for ex-politicians to engage in lobbying and why their best employment prospects might be in areas where they worked as a minister. This should not support an argument for lobbying. However, it does indicate that we need to review how the legitimate interests of especially medium-term parliamentarians transferring out of public life are ethically addressed. This is a better approach than compromising the integrity of the system or leaving dedicated, hard-working politicians out in the cold merely because the political tide has turned.